Hey. Well, welcome. I am Heather Ritter. I'm the director of the Justice Moore Museum. I'm an associate professor of biology and museum studies at Irwin College. And I am so thrilled to give you a hearty welcome from the Joseph Moore Museum, home of the world's most complete fossil giant beaver. <laughs> we are here, for anyone online, we are here on the campus of Earlham College in Richmond, Indiana. And we are so thrilled to get to talk with you in person, this big crowd here, and for folks online. We will have time for Q&A at the end, so um, please be ready for that. I am really pleased that we could do this in the summer. We run on a skeleton crew. Did you get that skeleton crew? Um, and so our staff all came together to really make this happen. And I wanted to thank Julia right here, running some tech for us. <laughs> Julia has helped so much make this happen. Rachel. I think is probably directing people from the museum right now to make sure everyone can find the location. As I said, I hope you're going to host this in the lobby. <laughs> this is just to sit around with maybe 10 people. Um, Rin, also down here, is amazing. Thank you, Rin. I think Claire and Gabriel are probably still the museum directing folks. Thank you. I hope they're able to log in. Noel is standing here making sure everything works. Thank you. And Vincent is also here with one of the screens, making sure everything is working. Thank you. And Eliza is celebrating her husband's birthday today. He can't be here, but she has been helping tremendously as well. And that's basically our entire staff. <laughs> so then, crew, we are doing it. Um, housekeeping, there are bathrooms outside. Uh, just through this door and to the left, there are men's, women's, and unisex bathrooms. There are two exits here, up there and down here. So in any case you need to leave, you can use either of those exits. Don't make your bladder explode. If you need to get up, just get up. It's going to be okay. Okay, we are here in person and online for a variety of reasons. Some of us are scientists who are excited by these developments in interspecies uh, communication. Some of us are pet lovers who want to build strong relationships with our furry family members. Some of us have rescued animals from shelters, from roadsides, from rural backyards. And some of us have been saved by the love of an animal. But all of us, I think, are excited here to hear from Dr. Amalia Bastos. She is a postdoctoral researcher from UCSD. And she studies interspecies communication. She has studied some pretty cool species. She studied kias, which are the mountain parrots of New Zealand, uh, New Caledonian crows, uh, and is and has been working on dogs. Um, for all the children who are interested in working with animals when you grow up, I think Dr. Amalia is sure to provide inspiration. I hope you'll all join with me in giving her a very warm welcome.
squares are ouch. Square ouch. In your ear? Where, stranger? In your paw? Let me see your paw. Okay, I'm gonna put this down. This is this stranger in our paw. She's got a mat between her oh, toes, and that's stuck in it. Now I'm gonna have to figure out how to remove the mat between her toes. So some of you might know this dog. Her name is Bunny. She's as close to an influencer as a dog can get. Uh, seven million followers on TikTok, uh, and I think her board is up to 110-ish buttons. Uh, and she's quite a prolific talker in what got me into this project uh, in the first place. And um, uh, it, it seemed like an easy way to sort of figure out what animals are thinking and feeling and how they want to communicate about things. And this all was very straightforward, but there's a history to this field of trying to communicate with animals. It's called uh, interspecies communication or animal language studies, which is a little bit more complicated. And I want to give you some background on why it's a difficult field. So, in the 1920s and 1930s, they started to try and teach chimpanzees to talk, as in speak with their vocal cords. And the way they did that is they uh, raised two juvenile chimpanzees alongside the researchers' children. So they would wear diapers and go around the house as children would, and they would get the same treatment as the children. And this went on for a couple of years. And by the end of a couple of years, uh, very generously, you could interpret them as saying two words, mama and pop. Uh, and that's if you interpret it quite generously when you're listening to what you're saying. And so they concluded from that study that chimpanzees could not talk, and of course the reason might not be that chimpanzees can't understand how to communicate with humans or how to use symbolic uh, language, but rather because chimpanzees don't have vocal tracks to produce the same sounds as humans do. So that shifted the focus of the field a little bit, and now people started trying to do the same thing when signing. So there were several different studies in the 1950s or around then where they tried to teach uh, several different types of apes to communicate with humans by using sign language. So on the uh, slide that we have, Washo was the very first one as a chimpanzee uh, that was sort of American sign language. Then we have Coco the gorilla, who became quite famous. Uh, there's Ninjinsky, who was wearing clothes, and I'll address that in a moment. And then uh, Nantek, the orangutan. So there's, there's a wide range of attempts uh, to teach these animals to communicate with language, but uh, the findings were a little bit controversial, and not all scientists agree that that was good science, and not all scientists agree that they uh, were using language per se, but they might have been doing simpler things. But more importantly than that are the ethical considerations we take into account when we're thinking about animals uh, like apes in human environments that we're trying to train to use language in this way. So one thing to remember is that chimpanzees, orangutans, etc., they all look very cute when they're juveniles, they're adorable babies, but they grow up to become wild animals that should be kept in human environments for a number of different reasons. So first of all, chimpanzees become very aggressive when they grow up, so around two or three years of age, especially with the males, that's also really kicks in. And there were several incidents where uh, researchers were attacked by the animals that they were studying. Um, so that's certainly not ideal. Uh, the second problem is that they were being kept in human environments, which are very different from their natural environments. So they couldn't go around and find trees and do things that chimpanzees should be doing, right? And so uh, they were in this artificial setting, which is really bad for them and for their uh, welfare, so even their mental health, right? So that's another issue with trying to do this with our closest relatives, the chimpanzees and other apes. There's also uh, the problem that, well, not a problem, it's great actually, but they live 30, 40, 50 years. And if the researcher starts working with this animal, when the animal's, uh, you know, a, a, a very young juvenile, but the research, researcher says 30, at some point that researcher's 
home and human environment anymore, but even if they could, uh, someone has to put the issue taking care of that animal for that wall, right? And finally, you remember that I showed uh, a photo before of Nimchinsky wearing human clothes, and again, here's the chimpanzee in a diaper, and this is a really terrible idea, because if you share photos of apes and monkeys doing things in human homes, or if you share photos of apes wearing human clothes, people think that they're pets, and that they can have one, and they can bring one into their home, and the problem is that that encourages poaching. So, all in all, very controversial to study this with apes, not only because the science wasn't 100% uh, there, but also because of the ethical considerations here. And now we have a really cool opportunity because, of course, with domesticated animals, their natural environment is a human home. We're not actually taking them away from their wild environment to do this, and they also communicate with us naturally. Chimpanzees have very little interest in telling us how they think and feel because they should be out there communicating with other chimpanzees, right? But dogs and cats and other domesticated animals are uh, more likely to want to talk to us about how they're thinking and feeling. So I'll focus mostly on dogs, because that's most of the research uh, that I'm working on at the moment. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit about how dogs in particular might be especially good for this. So dogs are very good at paying attention to what humans are doing. Dogs uh, are excellent at figuring out that you're pointing at things and following the point, and they do that without any training. Puppies do this without ever being trained on it before. So if you have two buckets, one has food in it, and the other one's empty. Let's say they both have the same amount of food scent on them, right? So the dog is using scent. You turn them upside down, you point at one, and if the dog doesn't know where the food is, they're probably going to know where you point. And chimpanzees aren't so good at that. Chimpanzees actually don't follow the human pointing. Uh, we're not sure if that's because they think that humans are uh, competitors, competitors rather than friends, but dogs seem to understand, hey, they're pointing at something. They're showing you where the food is. This is a collaborative thing. I'm going to move towards that dog, right? So dogs actually outperform our closest relatives at this kind of thing. Another interesting thing about dogs is that they pay close attention to what we say, uh, whether we like it or not. Some of you may have had to spell out W-A-L-K before, because it's not yet what you And dogs are actually picking up on all sorts of regularities of language as well. So we know that dogs can distinguish the owner's language from other languages, and they can also tell when words start and when they end, which is called word boundary recognition, uh, just by listening frequently to that language. And we also know that dogs pay very close attention to how we feel and how we express our emotions. So for example, uh, there was one study in 2012 where an owner was sitting on the couch and they either cover their face and start pretending to cry or they cover their face and start humming and the dogs were much more likely to approach the owner and start thinking that they were crying when they were humming. Now, that's not to say that dogs feel empathy. There are several more steps that we need before we can address that scientifically, but they definitely felt the difference between the two things. And similarly, a different study also suggests that when someone looks into a box and looks delighted by whatever the contents of the box are, and then looks at another box and seems quite disgusted by what's in the box, the dog goes and investigates the box the person was happy about. So they can distinguish between our facial expressions uh, and also the accompanying vocalizations that we make. So, ooh, or ah. Uh, so they can tell that those are now another really cool thing about dogs is not just passively taking in all the information that we give them, but actually trying to communicate with us actively as well. So they produce all sorts of uh, types of communication with us. So one thing that dogs do is bark, and it doesn't sound like a lot, but wolves when they bark, it's always in an aggressive context, right? And usually juveniles bark in wolves. Adult wolves don't bark so much. Now dogs of all ages bark, and bark in all sorts of situations. So they bark when they're playful, when they feel lonely, when they want food. And the really interesting thing about barks is that it seems that over the last 12 or 16,000 years of their co-evolution with us as we domesticated them, we actually selected barks to sound different from each other, depending on the context in which the dog is barking. So if uh, you listen to just audio recordings of a dog barking when it's playful versus when it's lonely, even if you can't see, what, what happened while the dog was doing that, you can't tell these things apart. We also have machine learning algorithms that can tell the same apart. So there's some properties of those sounds that are very easy to distinguish. There's also body language. So one fact that I really like about dogs is that, you know those puppy dog eyes where they put their little eyebrows up and they look very miserable, uh, and you want to 
particular food, well, wolves don't really have that same muscle uh, to the same extent on the inside of their eyes. It looks like we bred this into dogs so that it would look more adorable and feed them and take care of them. So dogs are exploiting this, right? <laughs> and the other interesting thing uh, is that dogs actually use that muscle when they make that face when they're facing a human, so when they're looking at a human as opposed to the humans looking away from them. So they're definitely exploiting you on this side. Okay. <laughs> and trying to get another way that dogs communicate with us is through gesture. So we know that dogs have, uh, well, there's one person that dogs have 19 different gestures to communicate with humans. So we know, for example, if your dog wants to go outside, you might go to the door and scratch at the door. That counts as a gesture, right? Or if you're typing in your computer and your dog wants attention, it might touch your arm. That's another gesture. Other species aren't that interested in communicating with us and gesturing to us. It seems like a very dog thing to do. So I'm being dog-centric, but cats are great too. But. <laughs> You'll see that the study is mostly at the moment uh, about dogs. Okay, great. So why are we interested in these dog events? Well, I, I hinted at this earlier, that this might have some implications for uh, their welfare. And this goes both ways, actually. It's probably very good for the animal and probably very good for us. So on the animal side, it gives them some control over their environment. So some owners think that they know exactly what their uh, pets want, and then they teach them to use buttons, and then the animals are asking for completely different things from what they predicted. So now the dog actually gets to have a say in how to live its life, which seems to be like a valuable uh, welfare outcome from this research. Second, imagine if your dog would tell you when it needs to go to the vet, rather than waiting for you to figure out that it's sick, right? Because we might not be so good at taking up on their body language, and it might take us much longer, by the time you take it to the vet, maybe the situation has escalated, and it turns out that, yes, that you can see uh, dogs that are more advanced stages of illness more often than the early stages. So this could help us catch things earlier on and help the dogs. It could also reduce uh, animal human misunderstandings. So I think there's about 350,000 cases of uh, bites uh, that take people to emergency rooms every year in the US alone. And it seems like most of the time it's because people get a little bit too hands on with the dog and the dog is uncomfortable. And the way that the dog tells you that it's uncomfortable, besides all the body language that people might not be very good at picking up on, is they punch you, right? But imagine if the dog could tell you, please stop, <laughs> please stop punching me, rather than a person that I've never met before. I'd rather not make it up with reduce the misunderstandings we have. So this is just one extreme example of what that would be other misunderstandings at a smaller scale as well. And finally, this provides uh, animals with uh, lifelong enrichment, so it keeps their minds occupied, which is a very good thing. You probably want to press the buttons rather than uh, running your couch. Mm -hmm. um, and it can solve problem behavior. So we have anecdotally some owners of dogs who use buttons are saying that their dogs bark less excessively now that they have buttons. So now they communicate what they want, they stop barking all the time, which is probably also a good thing. All right. And that's the benefits for humans, right? So this uh, sort of button using with dogs really took off uh, during the pandemic because people was, were uh, quarantining in their houses, feeling very alone, and they thought, why can't I just talk to my pet? And that's exactly what they did. And uh, at least through owners' reports, it seems like people are very happy that they can talk to their dogs now and reduce the If you live alone, you can now at least try to talk to your dog. I can't guarantee to you that your dog is saying things that make sense. That's where the science comes in, but it might help the humans regardless, right? Second, um, imagine situations where you have working animals like search and rescue dogs or police dogs or alert dogs for people with seizures and say they can actually specify what's going on with buttons, right? So the police dog might be able to say, I sniff this or that substance in the suitcase. Or, you know, maybe I just smell food in the suitcase and I alert to it because I'm kind of hungry and then we don't need to arrest this person because it's not actually the All right. And we can also uh, hopefully understand our pets better, uh, which helps us because we can improve the bonds that we have with the animals that we've got in our house. And that's something I hear again and again from these pet owners that they feel a lot closer with their animals once they start the bond training because they get some interesting insights as to how their animal feels, how their animal thinks, and what their animal's opinions are, which you don't know if you don't ask them, right? And this, of course, is all, uh, all complements to the scientific approach, which, of course, we're interested in how 
they perceive their environment, how they think, um, and also what kinds of, uh, how complex their, their linguistic skills can get as well. So these are all things that we're interested in, but I really want to highlight that the welfare implications could be huge. Okay. So the way this works is we started uh, this study. I mean, uh, Dr. Federico Orson's uh, lab at the University of California, San Diego. And we're recruiting all these dogs that use boars, also cats that use boars. Right now, I'm working on dogs. Um, and this could be any type of board from any brand, any design. It could be set up however you want. Some dogs have their boards up on the wall, and they just scratch with their noses. Um, but the idea that these dogs are being taught how to use their boards through modeling. So modeling is basically when owners demonstrate to the dog what that dog means through uh, association. So for example, say you want to go outside, every time you go outside, there's a button by the door, because usually how people start, they start with an outside button by the door, they'll press outside and open the door. So every time the owner is going outside or letting the dog outside, they'll press outside. So the dog now associates that every time the door is open and they get to go outside, that thing is pressed. And one day, the dog might press the outside button, whether it be by accident or intentional, doesn't matter. But the owner responds very enthusiastically and they use this they press the button, they open the door and let the dog outside. <laughs> and over time, the dog understands that the outside button means that door is getting opened. And then the owner starts introducing more buttons. So you can have a play button for you know, the toys are coming out, or they play now, or you can have a water button for a refilling or water bowl, etc. And over time, the dog's button boards increase, and um, it seems, again, I don't really know as I explain, that the more buttons you have, the easier it becomes to add more buttons, because at this point, after a few buttons, the dog understands, okay, each new button has a different meaning, or I have to just figure out what's the meaning of this one. Okay, so the, um, our scientific approach is divided into three main phases. The first phase is about self-reported data, so surveys, questionnaires. We just send out questionnaires to owners, and we have them fill in information about their dog. Everything from demographic information to what words do you think your dog knows? How well do you think they know these words? And then we sort of have uh, bi-weekly uh, bi -weekly reports that the only is like talking about. Right? We don't ask owners to do this every two weeks, compulsory, but you know, every two weeks the owners are welcome to give us an update on how their dogs are doing and what they've learned since then and how their sound board has changed. So that's the first phase. And then the second phase, we take a very small number of dogs and we start putting cameras in their houses. Again, of course, the owners can send. We'll have three different camera angles and we record 24-7 everything that happens to the dog's life, what buttons the owners are pressing, what the dogs are pressing, and also the advantage of having that video and audio information is get all this additional information, right? So you know what's going on in the background of the house, you know how the dog is behaving while they're pressing the buttons, things that you wouldn't know from just written down questions. And then phase three, and that's where uh, I come in, I'm mostly involved with this one, our controlled studies, where we actually test what the dog understands in a controlled environment. So this involves both uh, Zoom visits, also instructions to owners so that they can do in their own home, but uh, also it involves visiting people in their homes, which is why I'm here today. I'm doing a big tour of the Midwest and the East Coast to visit a lot of dogs, so it's a great part of my job. So at the moment, we have about a thousand, or well, over a thousand active participants, which means they're submitting these progress reports every couple of weeks or so, and uh, they're everywhere, all over the world, which is awesome, which means that we have dogs learning things in different languages as well. So not all dogs are English speakers, <laughs> so it seems. Some of them have other languages, and they're also spread out throughout all of the U.S. There's a dog in every U.S. state. And uh, as I said, the, the really fun part of my job is I get to go around and meet all these dogs. So these are some of the participants from our recent visit to uh, California and Nevada, and right now we have many more underway. Tomorrow we'll be seeing Heather's uh, dog. <laughs> so meeting all these dogs, and in this context, we're really testing whether they really understand what the chords are about, or they really know what's going on with their sound board and control setting. So we do some weird things with the owners, like asking them to wear headphones and uh, sleep masks so they can't see or hear what's going on, so they can't keep the dog, etc. All right. And now to conclude, I just want to show you a few interesting videos and then comment them so you can see the kinds of things that are really compelling to us as scientists, but also really interesting from the perspective of how 
we had in the thing. So this is Parker. It's a pretty self-explanatory video, but there's an ambulance outside her house. She has a bone of shame on.
So with that, <laughs> I'll wrap up. Um, recently, this uh, article came out in the New York Times where they asked four people, uh, four famous researchers who work with dogs to explain what we know about dogs. And the general conclusion of the article is that dogs are a lot better at telling what we want than we are what dogs want. And the hope is that uh, this research can help us reverse the fashion and give back to dogs what they've given to us, which is uh, an understanding of who we are and what we want. So thank you very much.
radio yesterday talking, I don't know whether it was yesterday, but she posted it today. And she mentioned that her older border colleagues started with learning the words, but did not learn as many words as the younger one. And I, so the question that I have is I'm kind of wondering, the difference between, say, the older border colleagues' communication with Heather and what happens now with the length, with putting the words to it. Because part of what she said, and I find this fascinating, is that in some way, a dog that already has figured out methods of communication with its owner maybe is less likely to pick up on this new method of communication. And I, that fascinates me a little bit because I'm, I'm always interested in how much work dogs do to understand us versus how much work we do to understand them. They do quite a lot more. Um, but I think that there's two parts to the question and both are interesting. One is um, the fact that, you know, the older dogs might already have something that works. So why would they switch that over? You know, if I walk to the dog's scratch, I already know I'm going to go outside. Why would I switch that over? Um, and that's actually one of the, uh, you know, some people criticize this and say, oh, but the dogs are not using their natural behavior anymore. But we're finding so far is that that's not true. So what we're finding so far is that the dogs are actually complementing their button presses with natural behavior. Substituting one for the other. So a lot of us will press outside still go to the door and scratch it. They're just making it extremely clear through two points of communication. Um, in terms of age, we don't know whether there's a critical period where it might be easier, you know, just like with humans, if you try to acquire a second language, it's much easier to acquire your career for your soul, because that's just how much more plastic your brain is. Uh, before the neural connections get, you know, chopped down and uh, proven and you can't learn new things as easily anymore. It might be the case for dogs as well. We also know that that's the case for birds. Birds have a critical learning period. If they don't learn that species song in that time, uh, they're going to have a very weird song when they grow up. So. <laughs> <laughs> it, could, it could be that they're in a critical period and we're sort of working to try to disentangle that and figure that out. Um, and we have evidence both ways. So we, we have some older uh, animals that are doing very, very well, especially cats. We have cats with 70 plus questions who are 15 years old. So. It's, it's an interesting news, but I can't give you an answer one way or the other. So I'm an anthropologist, and I, I appreciated your introduction and mentioning the work on chimps and, and other apes. So with this topic, my brain immediately goes to Kanzi the Bonobo. Yep. Okay. yep. So I'm interested if you could opine what you think about that research just generally, and specifically Kanzi's use of a lexicon. And the ability to, like the speaker car, sort of string multiple things together in independent ways. Uh, if you think the Kanzi research is meaningful, or I don't know, I'm just giving you an opportunity to sort of opine on that. Yeah, Kanzi is super interesting to me because also he was not necessarily the goal of the training. They were trying to train his mother, but he's like this infant but who just happened to be around and picked up all these lexicons. Uh, as far as I can tell, Kanzi understands the vast majority of things that are on his lexicon. That's kind of as similar as you get to this dog research because it's more, uh, you know, dogs can't judge obviously. So they have the soundboards that are more similar to the uh, lexicons. Um, I think Kanzi is interesting, and Kanzi seems to be showing things like displacement, so talking about things that are relevant here and now, and productivity, where he's combining different things. Um, I, and, and you know, it's like the dogs are very similar to the Kanzi situation, so I don't think necessarily that one is more informative than the other. It's just that for the dogs, there's obvious welfare benefits, whereas for Kanzi, I'm not sure. You know, it's more just purely the linguistic science side of things. Does that answer the question? Oh, for sure. And I think that Kanzi's sort of a rock star. And he's <laughs> kind of like, it, it, it's interesting to me that so many dogs are able to do this, whereas Kanzi's kind of the, the really the only one who, who's able to really approach this true level of so I think that's interesting sort of in human evolutionary studies. And like you were saying before, thinking about the fact that dogs are, are codependent uh, sort of on us. And so maybe there's more sort of evolutionary advantage to really nail it down this communication process. Yeah, I think that's the thing with the Nazi one. that feel a little more than a chimp. And when the are much more friendlier, they're like probably more, like, more likely to want to interact with a human than a chimpanzee and more chimpanzees. Uh, but also the fact that, um, where was I? I lost my hand of that. There was something else interesting about Kanzi. Yeah. The fact that they're 
Sorry? You can bake pie. Well, <laughs> he also knows bread, which is, yeah. which is interesting. Yeah. Uh, but but constantly being able to know what he helps, because he's now being preparing his chimpanzees and orangutans that are less human friendly. So I think that's one thing that he's done too. And then he also has the advantage. What has been your biggest surprise during the research? Ooh. Um, Definitely dogs doing things that are unexpected if you try to use a more simple social explanation for how they're behaving and what also they're pressing. Sometimes they surprise us. Other times they surprise us because it doesn't make any sense. So it's, uh, it goes both ways. Sometimes uh, it might only make sense because we don't have the contextual information to use the part of what they're trying to say, or maybe they're just pressing things at random. But uh, I think Sasha's, uh, sorry, not Sasha, Sasha Neil and Parker's video asking for us to come back to the first bridges was. Uh, a particularly <laughs> great moment for me because I was like, wow, that makes sense, doesn't it, given the, given the context. And same for the, 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 the ambulance uh, speaker car. So all these presses that are surprising and you wouldn't necessarily expect a dog to do that, also presses where they're just telling the owner things. They're not asking for anything. You know, when she presses the speaker car, she's not requesting the speaker car. She doesn't want the owner to give her the speaker car. She's just going, hey, you should notice that the speaker car is like her. Uh, we haven't, so far I haven't seen 
seen an issue with having a second person come in and start using the buttons. Sometimes people have visitors and have visitors who press the buttons, so the dogs seem to be okay with that. Um, but there are people who have uh, sort of person names on their board, so they can say mom this or mom or that, that, and they can press the buttons for different people. Uh, yeah, it's uh, not, not as confusing to the dog as it we might think so far. That's, that's what we've observed anyway. Two pets use the, the protocol at the same time. Uh, we actually seen pets communicate with each other using the sampler. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So like one dog had their bones stolen and the other one went around and said no. Um, <laughs> so it seems to be. I don't know exactly how uh, how you know uh, consistent that is, but it seems like some dogs are, are pressing buttons to others, and between species as well. So often dogs will talk to cats. As I was saying, the small as much, but the dogs have to try to I'm going to add a little further to that. But, um, but we also see uh, really, really interesting is like some, sometimes you see dogs doing something that seems like they're feeding for other dogs. So we have uh, one dog in the study called Mila, and there's a dog man in her household that doesn't use buttons, and Mila seems to suppress things on behalf of Shatsi, the other dog. So some, there's a, a video where Shatsi's in the crate, Mila asks the owner help Shasi or whatever asking to go the crates. So, yeah, lots of interesting anecdotes like that that we want to quantify in some way. Um, cats, okay, this is going to sound strange, but maybe not cat owners, but cats are very emotional. Cats use their mad buttons a lot, and there's a buttons, and I don't, I don't know if that reflects the mod name of the owner, or if just, that's just what cats want to press about. But it seems like cats are using their emotions as one of the dogs. But again, I don't know how to scientific data to back that up yet. Questions? No? Any other questions? 